Oh, good morning and welcome to the final show of 2021. This is 11 Zs 201. I'm Kevin Williams of Survival Schools Rider Training and we're going to be taking a bit of a retrospective look at the first half of 2021. We'll be looking at the serious, the funny, the absurd and the just plain weird stories that have caught my eye over the past 12 months. So settle yourselves down, uh, grab yourself a brew and uh, stay with me for the next 30 minutes or so whilst I run over some of the retrospective events of the year. Um, January then. So January kicked off um, as I ran the first show of the year on Sunday the 3rd January. I have to say I was feeling fairly grim because despite rigorously self-isolating um, over the previous couple of weeks, Judy and I had both managed to go down with COVID over the new year. Um, only Judy had actually been out of the house for two weeks, I think, at this point, um, apart from walks around the park and that kind of thing. Um, she went to do a, um, a pharmacy run um, for a shielding friend and picked up some drugs. And she also had to do a sort of a, a mercy visit, as it were, to a... Um, to a friend, uh, no, a relative who just lost a parent. So um, they were the only two times we went out, and unfortunately, um, we somehow we managed to bring COVID back to the house. So I managed to drag myself out of bed to do the um, the first show of the year. Um, but I have to say, I wasn't feeling particularly fantastic. I spent the best part of three or three days in bed, um, unable to move. Um, and I, I guess there were relatively mild symptoms, all things considered. Of course, nobody was jabbed um, really back then. Um, and the, 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 the long-term effect, though, for me, was that I, I did actually have a very long tail of fatigue. And it was actually six or seven weeks till I actually felt that I was anyway back to normal. Um, so really, it was March till I was back on full form. Um, one of the more positive stories about COVID, um, which of course was causing us to be all locked down back in January, was the Cheshire bike dealer turned their showroom into a vaccine delivery centre. Um, it was right at the beginning, as you probably recall, of the vaccine rollout. So that was a really good piece of news. Um, rather less positive were revelations about a huge COVID outbreak at the DVLA uh, in their Swansea offices. And uh, what was really disappointing was the way the DVLA actually handled it. They denied that there were problems. Um, they denied that uh, lots of people had COVID. Then they denied that there were any issues with the building itself. Um, and there were various stories about workers being told they couldn't work from home but had to come into the office. Um, so it wasn't a very edifying story, really, uh, that the, the DVLA um, didn't come out of it particularly well. Um, January also saw what I had to, I described at the time was a uh, highly optimistic press release. Um, Elk Promotions were still announcing that the South of England classic bike jumble at Ardingley would take place on the 17th of January, right into January itself. Now, predictably, it didn't happen, um, but it did take um, some time before they actually cancelled it, literally just a, a week or two before the event, uh, which couldn't have been a great deal of fun for the people trying to book stalls or even the people who were sort of thinking they might actually be able to go out and do something right at the height of the lockdown. Um, the 2021 MCN motorcycle show in London was another victim. Um, other stories that popped up in the month of January. A council had to pay £70,000 to fix a cattle grid because self-driving cars were seeing it as a wall. Um, I did look into this in a little bit more detail. And as I recall, what the problem was, was that the road sloped and then the cattle grid was level and then the road sloped beyond it. So the car's detection systems were seeing this sort of sudden change in attitude as the cars um, hit the cattle grid um, and, and thinking it was an obstruction in the car's way. Um, Mahindra, the Ita uh, Italian, the Indian bike manufacturer, 
announced that it would be bringing bike manufacturing to Banbury. No more on that story recently. Rather sad news, the Ron Haslam Race School, something that had been running for many years and uh, had got many riders into um, sort of, well, well, not just track riding, but generally performance riding and riding better on track generally, um, had to close its doors. Um, a journalist, actually somebody who went on to write up a story with me, um, wrote a article about how the best way to stay warm on a bike was to spend um, £1,800 on Dane Easy riding kit. Um, he was t totted out from uh, tip to toe in Dane Easy kit, so it wasn't difficult to see um, exactly where the uh, impetus for that particular story had come from. Um, in a rather bit more bizarre uh, piece of news altogether, the FBI raided Ducati's California headquarters. Um, if you want to find out more about that story, you can go back to the uh, 11s in January, where I reported on that. And uh, a mountaintop blaze destroyed over 200 exhibits at a classic motorcycle museum in Austria. Uh, the building was made entirely of wood um, and it was snowed in, which made it almost impossible, of course, for the fire services to actually reach the building. Um, so unfortunate loss to um, the sort of motorcycle heritage there. Um, right, who have we got uh, looking in this morning? Paul's arrived and said good morning, wishing everybody a um, happy new year. Uh, Nigel's also looked in and uh, saying Merry Christmas and best wishes for the new year. Thank you, uh, uh, Nigel and Paul. And Martin has also uh, popped in and said Happy Holidays. Uh, thanks to all you guys. And uh, I wish very much the same, of course, to everybody else. Um, OK, so as I uh, said for the latecomers, um, I'm doing a retrospective of the first six months of the year, last year, this year, um, whenever it was, I'm losing track, aren't I, already? Um, there are always depressing stories about biking, as well as the sort of uh, ones that reassure us that most cyclists aren't completely um, mad. Um, but in this particular case, this story came from Australia, and it was pretty tragic. Um, what happened in this case was that so a woman was riding her motorcycle, um, at the same time as some locals took it into their head to chase a, bike, a car thief. Um, so the two vehicles were hurtling down the road. Um, there was a loss of control. I'm not quite sure. I uh, can't quite remember which vehicle lost control, but the one of them was involved in a collision with the motorcycle and the rider was sadly killed. So she was doing absolutely nothing wrong, but uh, just um, ended up being the victim of this uh, sort of vigilante chase. Now, within days, scammers had created a fake fundraiser for this woman biker, um, which I think is an utterly appalling and heartless um, thing to do. But if you think that's bad, then just a few days later, some local teens actually burgled her house. Um, they were nailed by the police fairly quickly. Um, in another story, um, Visor Down um, looked at the new Yamaha MT25. Now, this isn't a two and a half litre motorcycle, it is just a quarter litre. Um, and the writer pointed out that the bike is destined for markets like India and Indonesia, and we're very unlikely to see it in the UK, particularly as it's a 300 here already. Um, but he suggested that it could be a stepping stone for a new rider. So what, it, what basically he was proposing was that um, at 17, you can get on a 125. And then what he was saying was, why shouldn't riders who are 19 um, be allowed to continue on just a CBT, but move up to the 250cc motorcycle? And uh, his justification was that it's uh, a sort of halfway stepping stone between the learner-friendly MT125 and the, the A2 bike, the MT03. Um, well, the... Um, Bit of history on that one. Um, CBT was brought in in 1990, and the whole idea of CBT was to prevent learner riders jumping on a bike with no experience, like I did, and going out on the road with no training, like I did, and crashing, like I did. So CBT uh, does offer novice riders a minimum of skills 
and you do get at least a couple of hours on the road with a bike training before you're let loose to deal with the roads on your own. Now, whether CBT ever reduced um, casualties on the road is a very moot point um, because um, there are often fingers pointed in general direction of crash stats, which went down at the time that CBT was introduced. But of course, it also um, reduced the number of motorcyclists on the road. A lot of people who are riding 250 on old plates at that point simply gave up. They didn't downsize to a 125. Um, some did, some didn't. Some, of course, tried to beat the legislation by taking their test, which was a much better idea, frankly. Um, but the upshot of the number of registrations of bikes going onto the road is that it went down. So the implication is there were fewer riders on the road. Um, but perhaps what the writer has forgotten, because um, in just a few months it will be 40 years ago, um, the 250 uh, law um, which banned those bikes came in precisely to prevent unqualified riders from riding bikes just like this MT-25 on a learner license. They were the so-called Els Angels 250s. And uh, if you are old enough or you uh, have an interest in motorcycling history, you'll probably recall bikes like the RD250 LC and the Suzuki X7. Uh, the X7 was billed as the first 100 mile per hour 250, and it was probably the bike that put the uh, nail in the um, the 250 L plate coffin. Um, so what's the MT25 get? Well, it gets a parallel twin four-stroke engine, but according to the spec sheet, it pumps out no less than 35.5 horsepower. Um, that's a fairly astonishing amount of power from a uh, 250 single, um, frankly. Um, and it's more than either of those two strokes did 40 years ago, the ones that actually introduced the 250 ban. So the question is really, do we want riders on L plates hurtling around on those bikes? Um, personally, I don't think so. There is a reason that the um, you take a test. It's to prove that you are reasonably competent in most of the driving situations that you're going to encounter. CBT cannot possibly um, offer you that level of um, instruction in just one day. And one of the problems is I, I used to find when I was training people who'd been riding around on one, two, fives on L plates for years was they really had got into a whole bunch of bad habits and training them out of those habits was far more difficult than it was teaching them to ride well in the first place. So my thinking is uh, basically that if anything does need to be changed, it's the access age to take a test on a bigger bike. It's not to give people a uh, sort of access on a learner plate. It is actually to change the age date at which you can take the bigger bike test and get people onto that A2 motorcycle earlier. I think that is the right way to go ahead. Um, in other news this month, um, the BMF uh, actually accidentally revealed the existence of a, a new motorcycling council that was being formed uh, on motorcyclists' behalf. Uh, it was an organisation intending to speak with one voice on behalf of all riders. The word of the, the formation of this uh, new National Motorcyclist Council appeared ahead of the official news um, because it appeared in a press release on the British Motorcyclist Federation um, website. Um, I spotted it and ran the story too. Um, the thing I remember pointing out about this was that um, whilst there, there were lots of different groups represented, um, all those groups are sort of special interest groups. None of them actually are general, you know, there's no, there's no input from motorcyclists. Um, and in the more or less years since this organization has been running, I've seen no attempt to engage with motorcyclists. There's been no polls. Um, there's been uh, there have been no um, press releases aimed at motorcyclists that I can see. Um, yes, you do need a body which can talk to government at the top level to talk to the DVLA, to the DFT, um, to the uh, DVSA. Um, it, some some organization, a coherent organization with a united front is needed, but they also need to talk to bikers. It's no good just representing motorcycle organizations, even if they are like MAG and the BMF, who claim to have a broad church. Um, they do need to find out what ordinary motorcyclists who don't have anything to do with those motorcycle organizations want to do. 
Um, in other stories, um, UK bike sales were hammered. Shares uh, prices for Harley uh, plummeted themselves. Uh, Captain Tom, who have, uh, you probably remember, uh, his race bike was found in a museum. Um, and the MT-07-based sports bike replacement was um, sort of unveiled uh, in a leak uh, to replace the R6. And one really positive bit of news was the UK government scrapped the controversial off-road insurance law, which would have been enforced by the EU. And it would have meant that any bike used um, off-road for competition purposes would have required insurance so even if it was running on a closed circuit you would have needed to insure it uh, for third party risks and many people thought this would be the nail in the coffin for closed circuit racing let alone competitor events like enduros um, and well, actually enduros take place on roads don't they but but um you know the sort of the the, the entry level racing the sort of motocross that kind of thing um, March, what happened in March? Uh, well, sadly, Murray Walker passed away, aged 97. And uh, what I wrote at the time was that uh, he was a war veteran, um, but less well known uh, thanks to his sort of fame as a, a Formula One commentator, was that he was actually formerly a motorcycle racer and a child champion himself. Um, he began his broadcasting career in 1948 at the Chelsea Walsh Hill Climb. Um, and his first auto racing broadcast with BBC came as a corner commentator for the radio at the 1949 British Motorcycle Grand Prix. Now, as I said, although he's better known for his F1 um, commentaries, he dedicated most of his early career to motorcycles. Um, first, he was working alongside his father. And then he became the BBC's lead motorcycle racing commentator in 1962. And he moved on to Formula One in the 1970s before becoming uh, the full-time voice of the series in 1978. Um, I particularly remember a piece of commentary from the Silverstone Grand Prix, which probably was um, late 70s, maybe early 80s, very early 80s. I seem to remember Kenny Roberts was racing. Um, when the BBC timetable was inviolable um, because they covered horse racing and horse racing went out to betting shops, so it all had to go out live. Um, and the motorcycle racing had been delayed due to um, various crashes that needed clearing up. And Murray Walker said, uh, and, and as the 250 British Grand Prix gets underway, it's back to the studio and you could hear the disappointment in his voice as he handed over to the horse racing. Um, Walker was inspired by his father's work as a dispatch rider and he was a works motorcyclist uh, racer for Rudge, Sunbeam and Norton. And uh, when he was interviewed by The Guardian in 2007, he said he was in a tank regiment during the war. And when he came out, he had delusions of grandeur that he'd be able to show his father how a motorcycle really should be raced. Um, and he realized, he said, I was all right, but I wasn't good enough to satisfy myself. Um, obviously, he wasn't committed. Um, and he said he went on to um, move into business um, and the hobby uh, didn't take top billing because he said, I knew in my heart of hearts that he wouldn't be top man. Well, he certainly became top man in the commentary box. Um, somebody who probably won't be remembered um, for anything like as long as Murray Walker uh, is somebody called Azusaga Kuyaku, Ku, Kuyuki. Um, now, this turns out to be a young female bike blogger um, who turned out not to be a female bike blogger at all. Um, but a 50-year-old man. It was one of the bizarrest stories of the year. Um, this uh, man, woman, had developed a huge, huge social media following as she posted up her adventures as uh, on her love of playing with bikes uh, on her Yamaha. Um, but it turned out that her Twitter account, it had more than 17,000 followers, um, had been faked as she used, he used uh, video apps and Photoshop to alter his appearance. Um, 
the of course once the deception was revealed of the um everybody immediately ridiculed all those people who'd been taken in um by this man and uh, people wrote various things saying how obvious it was that uh, she was a he um one twitter user wrote uh, people fell for that the face looks really fake and damn that hairy arm um, if you do want to see what all the fuss is about, um, the Twitter feed um, it was there. Um, hopefully it still is there. You can still have a look at it. Um, you know, uh, there's plenty of other weird news on this particular month as well. Most people don't expect to encounter what appears to be a UFO on the way home from work. But uh, Richmond Mayambosa says that's exactly what happened to him in Zimbabwe. The 47-year-old claimed that the sudden appearance of an unidentified flying object caused him to fall off his motorcycle, uh, landing in with a trip to hospital to sort out a leg injury. He said, I was travelling home on my motorbike at about 9am when I witnessed a strange light travelling in the sky. I tried to concentrate on riding, but what made me fall was the sound that followed after the light. I fell off my motorbike due to panic. I thought I was dying. He also claims to have seen the UFO himself. He says the object looks like a rocket with fire on its back. I was 100% sober, but I was so confused because I thought I'd encountered these strange things people see in dark and thick forests. Other residents of the area say they also witnessed the bright light followed by a loud booming sound. And even the local meteorological services department has confirmed unusual activity in the area. Um, but no further was in, information was released. I never saw anything more on that story. Um, a problem faced by an Indonesian man at the same time was how to persuade his partner that he wasn't taking other girls on the pillion of his scooter. Um, so what did he do? Well, um, flowers weren't cutting it. Uh, neither was gentle persuasion. So he decided to say it with, say it with nails. Uh, essentially, he hammered nails through the bottom of his seat to prove that nobody was going for a ride. Um Something else that came up about that time, um, which led to uh, a rise in motorcycle prices, you probably noticed that bike prices have actually risen fairly significantly throughout the year. And in what was described by an industry expert as a black swan event, um, between sort of October, November and February, March uh, of the sort of 2020 2021 the cost of renting a 40-foot shipping container for the journey from asia to europe more than tripled it went up from around 1400 pounds um, to around six thousand or more now you're probably wondering why um the answer revolved around the the location of the containers they'd simply ended up in the wrong places now in the middle of the um last year containers were moving to the usa from asia but because of nine covid 19 restrictions almost nothing was going in the opposite direction now these containers that were in the us um stayed there for months um, they the ports became congested um, due to a lack of labor um, due to border restrictions customs work was also suspended um, and although china actually resumed exports a lot earlier than much of the rest of the world um, what in fact happened was that for every 10 containers they sent out they only got four back and uh, six got stuck at the arrival ports or uh, inland distribution centers. And the shipping companies um, weren't actually um, returning empty ship containers anyway. They There were a reduction in the number of ships operating. Um, so, you know, trade between the China and the US in particular is so huge that there are millions of containers stuck. Now, some governments did actually make very positive efforts to move things back. Um, in India, for example, the government-owned railway system uh, was moving empty boxes um, for free. Uh, South Korea uh, deployed nine extra vessel vessels on the uh, Trans-Pacific route to help local manufacturers. And China's state-owned shipyard um, has converted at least one uh, vessel to transport the containers. Um, so you may be wondering why people just can't build new ones. Um, well, you can, but that requires steel and the price of steel has gone up as well. Um, so 
most containers are built in China, and they are now charging two and a half thousand US dollars instead of sixteen hundred US dollars for a new one. Um, so the problem is that the transportation of um, high value goods has been affected and while it's not probably a full explanation for rising prices one of the other factors was uh, microchip shortages um, it will undoubtedly have impacted um, our bike prices now something else um, that's uh, popped up regularly uh, through the lockdown was um, the problem of motorcycles with illegal exhaust they frankly stood out like a sore thumb and it really shouldn't have been a huge surprise to motorcyclists that parish councils have been setting up uh, joint anti-noise groups um, on the other hand uh, a group has come together with a more positive outcome for bikers uh, honda ktm piaggio and yamaha they signed up a deal to produce and distribute swappable batteries Finally, in March, um, after months of lockdown and training schools being forced to suspend operations, the DVSA finally gave bikers the um, go ahead to go and get CBTs renewed. Because, as, as you'll probably remember, um, many riders got caught um, with a, their 12 month CBT expiring. Um, there were months of protests from bike schools um, to say they shouldn't be lumped in with car instructors. Um, unfortunately, that's exactly what the DVSA did. Uh, the obvious point was made that um, motorcycle trainers are uh, naturally self-isolated from their students uh, whilst they're riding around in the fresh air, um, unlike a car instructor who sat in the same car. Um, but even then, it wasn't good news for everybody. Uh, the devolved government in Wales kept the suspension of training in place. Um, over in France, bikers protested about the end of a filtering experiment which had unfortunately led to an increase in crashes um, the government changed their mind um, and decided to extend the trial uh, make it longer and cover more um, department as well and we first got the news that uh, for a definite date for the arrival of e10 fuel that's the one with 10 percent bioethanol uh, added to it when that, that turned up in uk and i also started um, virtual presenting for the 2021 shiny side up event in new zealand um, and so into april and unfortunately my time with shiny side up came to a very very abrupt end as new zealand went into lockdown and the live outdoor events had to be suspended we did get to run an online uh, show uh, later in the year but it, it uh, the 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 live events um, came to a complete standstill. Uh, one of the weirdest stories of the year was uh, Northumbria Police and Crime Commissioner. She proposed um, to um, tackle the theft problem that mandatory trackers should be fitted to all motorcycles. Um, everything. Um, pit bikes, motorcycles, Harley Davidsons, uh, racing bikes, absolutely everything, according to her, should be fitted with a tracker. Um, lots of people, of course, pointed out that this was a bit of a daft idea um, and questioned basically uh, the logic of her proposal and how much she actually knew about motorcycles in the first place. And uh, not too surprisingly, uh, one week later, she backtracked on that particular call. Um, but it did trigger a um, uh, mag to actually write to all police and crime commissioners candidates um, to tackle bike theft more seriously um, and it's a story that I ran or uh, bike theft is something I talked about on a number of occasions over the course of the year about the, uh, the, the the complete lack of interest really from the manufacturers in actually making their bikes theft proof um, there's very very little um, that stops somebody stealing a motorcycle. Um, the I did talk about trackers. Um, I talked about some of the expensive systems where you basically sign up for um, a uh, a monitoring system, which will um, 
li literally follow your bike on a screen and tell the police where it is. Uh, and I wondered how many bikes were actually ever recovered on uh, from those kind of systems. And uh, there was another story, I didn't actually cover it, but there was another story about someone who went all the way out, to, I think it was to Romania, uh, to recover his bike after the local police showed no interest whatsoever in uh, getting it back for him. Um, he had to go and do the job himself. Um, in other news, uh, Spanish vikers um, were asked to vote on the possibility of compulsory airbags. Uh, now, this was a proposal by the Spanish government to bring in the, um, a requirement for riders in urban areas and on motorways to wear airbags as a matter of course. Um, the vote was put to by one of the Spanish rider rights organizations. Um, and I was really surprised that it wasn't actually a clear cut no. I really, really thought that when they, the result of that came out, that it would be the vast majority of riders would be against compulsory airbags. But in fact, um, it was a majority, but it wasn't by a huge majority. A surprising number of riders did think that it was a good idea. Um, noise, I mentioned noise as a problem. Uh, murder inquiry was launched in Norwich after a man was stabbed over motorcycle noise. Um, strike action, the DVLA, um, just at the point, of course, when everybody was getting really frustrated about the lack of driving tests, the DVLA uh, decided to, um, that it was the examiners decided to ballot on industrial action due to plans to alter working practices, which would basically meant they having to do more work and um, get less time between um, driving tests. Um, and frankly, I sympathize with the driving instructors on this one. Um, another group to threaten strike action was Deliveroo uh, over the ter terms and working dish conditions as delivery riders. Uh, Triumph's Trident, um, the new 660 budget bike um, went out on tour. Um, the various police forces around the country launched their usual um, early summer or uh, uh, late spring um, campaigns to try to reduce bike deaths. And the Surrey police got hold of some acoustic monitors, which they were going to be pointing at motorcycles. Um, one story which um, I did look at, and I, f I forgot to check a bit more about this one. I've forgotten exactly what it was, but it, basically it was um, Cycling GB. Um, sort of they seem, on the one hand, to be wanting to work with motorcyclists, um, but on the other hand, when you actually looked at their plan uh, in detail about how the roads should be used, basically um, motorcycling was not seen as a viable way of sharing the roads with cyclists. Um, the other big story uh, for April was uh, smart motorways. Um, the smart motorways got put on hold uh, until radar technology was to be readied. Um, the problem was here that Highways England had denied that where they did have radar uh, detection for stop vehicles in place on motorways, they denied it was too far apart. But when they were putting it in on new roads, they were moving the sites closer together, which uh, kind of makes you wonder um, if they were telling the truth there. Um, one bit of good news as well for anybody riding and driving in the Harrow area. Uh, they were one of the councils who decided that they would scrap cycle lanes and low traffic neighbourhoods that had been put in during the pandemic as part of the sort of the uh, support for active transport, that is walking and cycling, um, which just basically made it more difficult for anybody else to get around who needed to. Uh, Kensington and Chelsea did the same in one of their uh, flagship schemes. And there have been a number of others who've also gone backwards on the cycle lanes and traffic neighbourhoods, um, low traffic neighbourhoods. Of course, not everybody has, and we still have have a vast number of these um, blocked roads, which makes it difficult for everybody to get around, not just uh, emergency services and delivery vehicles, but even locals have to drive around the block um, to get into their own house, which is bonkers, frankly. Um, 
May, the smart motorway stories weren't going away, um, and one report suggested that they may have seen twice as many fatal accidents as claimed. Um, naturally, the DFT jumped up and said no, the report was wrong, um, but one rider was facing life-changing injuries after he crashed, um, or I believe he broke down and was then hit by a vehicle on the smart motorway. Um, the I mentioned Deliveroo a moment ago. Well, another study on crash stats in London uh, was actually blaming the rise in home delivery uh, by uh, people like uh, Deliveroo and Uber Eats for uh, this rise in motorcycle crashes. Um, it's certainly something I think needs to be looked at. Um, the standards of riding of, of these people is um, appallingly low. Um, you know, people said in the 1980s when I was a motorcycle courier that it was like the Wild West out there. But frankly, the um, most motorcycle couriers did seem to have a self-preservation gene. Um, there was the old lunatic. But frankly, the riding of uh, most food delivery riders is absolutely appalling. Um, I nearly took one out not that long ago um, because I was turning left into a side road. There was a pedestrian crossing across the nose of the side turning. Um, I had to give way to a pedestrian. Um, and as I started to pull off again, um, I nearly hit a delivery rider who was riding up the wrong side of the road. Um, just to get to uh, a cafe which was happened to be on the near side. Um, so um, another story, um, you wonder sometimes how much councils have in their pot to spend and why they spend it on certain projects. Well, in this particular case, um, they wanted to keep uh, nuisance motorcyclists out of a park. Um, and they proudly showed off these barriers with the local councillor and uh, a member of the local police force. And uh, then they showed a picture of a motorcyclist riding straight between them. The barriers simply were too far apart to stop motorcycles going through. I mean, you wonder who on earth designed that and who tested it. Um, in London, a new initiative um, was announced that would extend the or it would change the way that traffic lights work um basically instead of pedestrian lights being green for traffic and only red when a pedestrian presses the button um it would go the other way around so that basically the lights would stay red until a car turned up at which point they would turn green um safety campaigners actually suggested this might not be the best solution because drivers would expect the lights to turn green and would drive straight through them um, rather than stopping when the lights turned red um, the only people who seem to be in favor are the traffic designers um, Bikers got uh, fined uh, for a fish and chip run that they shouldn't have done back in lockdown. And uh, something my insurance company didn't do, um, LV um, actually offered insurance refunds to bikers who were parked up and couldn't ride everywhere. Um, over in India, COVID was still um, not in a good place, even as we eased out of lockdown. Um, and Indian bike builders actually shut down production because it allowed um, oxygen that was needed for the bike production uh, to actually go to fight COVID in hospitals. And uh, possibly my favourite story of the year, Nico Rosberg was given an Energica electric motorcycle at the Monaco uh, F1 Grand Prix, and uh, he managed to drop it. Um, I wasn't too impressed with his riding kit either, as I recall, he was riding in a pair of trainers. Um, Anything else going on? Well, um, sadly, um, the a woman was actually killed in a crash uh, on a memorial ride for her son who'd been killed in a bike crash. And that was over in Colorado. Uh, Bennett's was bought by a company called Right Choice Holdings. Um, that's a story I'll come back to in the second part of the show next uh, week or uh, in 
on what's today it's wednesday isn't it sunday uh, the french government was working with riders rights groups to fight eu plans for motorcycle technical inspections um it's one of those stories where you kind of wonder did you read that right but no in fact it was the french government didn't want technical inspections on bikes and uh in one of the uh silly stories a former jet pilot develops trousers which have built-in airbags um you know um i can see the point um motorcycle injuries are often to the legs we talk a lot about airbag jackets but in fact leg injuries are where most of the uh, damage actually happens um June. Um, by June, the DVLA had been suggesting that 12,000 learners could lose their license as soon as they pass their test. Uh, over in Spain, um, I warned you that you needed to look out for lower speed limits. They have been reduced in many parts of the country. Uh, Spanish authorities um, were uh, expected to postpone the plan for compulsory airbag jackets, despite the, as I said, the fairly modest uh, level of objections. Paris was planning on charging for all motorcycle parking, which uh, was about to bring the uh, uh, the Federation of Angry Motorcyclists out. Um, E-scooter trials were due to begin in London, um, uh, just at the time where a pair of Liverpool riders actually got banned for drink e-scootering. Um, and a bit of positive news, a Somerset Town Council um, had installed ground anchors, uh, anchors for motorcyclists around several of its uh, towns. Um, National Motorcycling Council, I didn't think I mentioned them earlier, um, they finally broke cover and they and called for motorcycling to be incorporated into transport plans. And I thought, well, there's an original story. I don't think I've ever heard that one before. Um, last thing I wanted to mention today, um, the Scarborough uh, motorcycle races, they've been looked at, forward to by many people. Um, Scarborough is the only road race circuit in the uk and uh, that is not a closed track it is actually a public road it's actually the access road that goes around uh, a park um, and it's particularly narrow um, it's a bit scary um, a bit scary to watch beside actually because it's so narrow um, but it's a very popular venue always gets uh, a lot of uh, visitors and obviously brings in a lot of um, uh, cash to the town but unfortunately the um, track itself the infrastructure um, including the paddock um, area i think it was the, um, the 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 building that's used by the scrutineers uh, was in a state of collapse um, and the motorcycle races had to be postponed so the circuit's been closed and frankly many people are asking whether it'll ever open again um, i'm rather glad i did get a visit in there a couple of years ago but i was actually planning on heading up there this year uh, just to do something and watch some motorcycle racing this year right okay so um what have we got uh Nick says, hello, John Sinclair says CBT last two years, not one year. Um, yes, um, sorry, it does actually, John. Um, however, having said that, um, the point I was making was a lot of people got caught um, by the long period of lockdown and just simply couldn't get their CBT renewed before it ran out. Um, Samantha says, lights don't always recognize bikes being there. They can be stuck waiting for the lights to change forever. Um, absolutely. Um, I used to have to negotiate a set like that uh, to cross the A3 uh somewhere um i can't quite remember where but it was a, a journey i used to have to do fairly regularly and um i had two ways of getting over that junction and uh, one was to just literally park uh 20 meters back from the junction wait till the car came up and uh, parked on the sensors in which case i'd then tuck in behind the car and the lights would change normally or if it was really quiet and there was no traffic around uh, if i was out late at night for some reason i would simply get off the bike uh, push it onto the pavement walk over to the pedestrian lights press the button on the pedestrian lights cross the road as a pedestrian pushing the bike and remount on the far side when i was clear of the a3 um but yes, it is a problem. Um, there are various um, tricks that people use. Some people say if you put the side stand down, 
um, over the um, the sensor that'll trigger it um, it might work if you've got a steel side stand if you've got an aluminium side stand like I had on the GSXR it's clearly not going to make any difference at all um, but yeah the the answer is if you do get stuck regularly it's just pull up a bit short and let a car pass you and get parked on the sensor um, the problem is when you get a car driver who stops short of the sensor and then the lights simply don't change. I was stuck at a, a, um, uh, it's a, it's a single lane working uh, bridge over a railway line um, uh, last year. Um, and the, the driver in front of me stopped about 20 yards short of the traffic lights. And after we'd been there for about two or three minutes, I suddenly realized what the problem was, that he wasn't actually on the sensor. Um, so I went and knocked on his window and told him to pull up forwards. And he got very stroppy with me and said he was giving people coming the other way lots of room to get off the bridge. And I said, well, you're also giving them lots of time to get over the bridge because we're not moving until you park on that sensor. Um, anyway, uh, there we go. So, right, um, we will return with part two of the uh, retrospective of 2021 on the first show of 2022. And we'll look at what went on between July and December. So thanks, everybody, for looking in again. Um, don't forget, um, I do have a, um, a filtering um, webcast, which is going out on Wednesday at 8pm um, next week. Um, that'll be, um, I haven't got the link for you to hand, but it is in the comments uh, at the beginning of the show. Um, so do come along, um, watch that. I'll be giving you some tips on how to filter. Um, and I'll be hopefully talking about the sort of safety aspects of it in a way which makes sense to you as well. Obviously, as a courier, I did an awful lot of filtering. So um, that'll be Wednesday uh, next week. But right. OK, I've been yabbering away for far too long this morning. Um, so thanks, everybody, for looking in. And I will hopefully see you all again on Sunday when we'll do part two of this retrospective. So from me, Kevin Williams of Survival Skills, um, thanks again. And be safe out there if you are riding your bike today.